Hi everyone, Phil Travis here, and uh, this week's lesson is on the North American world at the time of European arrival, really. So we're going to be thinking about uh, the Columbian Exchange and the other presentation, and the significance of the collision of the old world and the new world, and we're also going to be thinking about what maybe the world looked like when Europeans arrived. How did it change? So I wanted to do this little lesson on early American inhabitants. So the image you see here is a depiction of an archaic Native American hunting a mammoth, um, which would have been um, very commonplace in North America around about 15,000 years ago. Um, so first, let's think about how do we learn about Native Americans? We'll take a second to think about that. How do we learn about Native Americans? After all, even the great Inca dynasty in South America had no written language. Um, the Mayan in Central America, in Mexico, um, they did have a written language, and we have been able to decipher their written language. But the Maya were very different from North American Native Americans, and, of course, the North American Native Americans had no written language. So how do we learn about these people? There really are two ways. Um, well, maybe three. Archaeology, which is the study of artifacts and using artifacts to piece together long histories. Also, anthropo anthropology, studying native peoples as they are today. And then the other, of course, is studying written materials that um, were developed at the time of and after European contact. Archaeologists believe that North America, South America were the last places that humans arrived. And the evidence for this is really based on human remains found in the Americas. Um, the Americas, the earliest known human remains of, 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 of arrow points and spear points, um, verify the idea that Native Americans probably migrated to the Americas during the last Great Ice Age, around about 15,000 years BCE. Um, that makes North America the youngest continent, uh, and South America the youngest continent when it comes to human populations. And of course, those migrations would have occurred over a long period of time as the Ice Age had caused sea levels to drop, and as Native Americans migrated across this area um, in their normal pursuit of big game, probably the large woolly mammoths. We've often called this land bridge Beringia, um, which is the predominant theory for how Native Americans populated North America about 15,000 years ago, a long, long time before, before Columbus arrived in uh, the Caribbean. Evidence of these migrations is a result of archaeology, um, th particularly the location of things called Clovis points, which are the spear points that are depicted in this image or pictured in this image here. Um, these spear points provide evidence of Native Americans hunting large mammoths. Um, there are also other, there's also evidence of other migrations too. There are um, some huge questions actually pertaining to whether or not um, some Native Americans populated the South America by using outrigger canoes. Um, of course, Easter Island, which is kind of located in the middle of nowhere, South Pacific. But if you look at Easter Island, from kind of a broad perspective, it seems pretty clear that it would be a long-term link in the peoples from Polynesia, Oceanic peoples migrating from island to island to Hawaii, ultimately to Easter Island, and so forth. So there's huge connect questions about whether or not that was a legitimate option. Um, Kennewick Man, too, uh, named after Kennewick, Washington, um, brought even greater questions as people, the remains of Kennewick Man um, predated the time in which we thought Native Americans had been here, and Kennewick Man, in terms of his anatomical features, 
seemed very not Native American. And so there remain some pretty great questions still, but the Clovis Point, by and large, does provide evidence that there was a huge migration of, of Native people across the land bridge um, about 15,000 years ago. These are Folsom Point, and these are small arrowheads that were discovered by George Majunkin in the 1920s um, in places like New Mexico. And these date till around about 9,000 BCE, and they, uh, are, they provide evidence of a change in environment and lifestyle for Native Americans. So we can use all, moving from hunting large game like mammoths to perhaps overhunting mammoths to hunting smaller game. Um, so we can learn a lot of things about Native Americans from archaeology, and we can learn things about basic origins, and we can learn things about the way in which they lived. Native Americans are not a singular culture, obviously, that goes without saying. Um, Native Americans are highly diverse, and they adapt to their surroundings. And another way that we learn about Native Americans is by looking at the things that, Native, that, that Europeans uh, wrote about Native Americans and kind of reading between the lines to reinterpret um, um, the way Native Americans might have seen things. One of the most famous examples of this is the story of Pocahontas. Um, the Pocahontas story, as it was presented in the Disney movie, or as it was presented by John Smith, who wrote that story over a decade after it occurred, the Pocahontas story is really a myth. Um, and the story, of course, of Pocahontas from the European perspective, as John Smith tells it, is that, you know, John Smith was captured by um, the barbaric Native Americans who were going to kill him, Chief Powhatan and the, and, and the Powhatan Confederacy in Virginia, and they were going to kill him, and the chivalrous young lady Pocahontas steps in and saves the day. Um, that story is, historians regard today, as pretty much a myth. And there's a famous book written in the 90s called um, Facing East from Indian Country. And it's been written by a guy named Daniel Richter. And Richter took the story of Pocahontas and read through the lines and reversed it and made the argument that actually what was happening there was not what John Smith thought. It wasn't this barbaric abduction and, um, and killing that was going to happen. But instead, Richter says it was probably, using his imagination in the story, it was probably more of an, an initiation ritual in which Chief Powhatan was showing his dominance to effectively the new weird tribe at Jamestown, Virginia. I say they're weird because they were pretty odd for, uh, Native Amer for North America at that time. But Chief Powhatan was probably, it was probably a ritual in which Pocahontas was acting far more than she was, you know, acting out of a kind of a, a spur of a moment behavior that Powhatan was trying to say that, hey, we are the most powerful tribe here and we will work with you, but we can take you out if we want. And so there's different ways of learning about Native Americans. Generally, European contact absolutely transforms Native American culture. Um, Native Americans have to adapt, have to change forcibly often uh, because of the um, the, because of the um, influence of the arrival of European people. Um, historians, it's thereby very difficult for historians to understand exactly the way North American Native peoples were because the only real written sources are either from Europeans or Native Americans who had been Europeanized over a long period of time. And so um, we have to use our imagination to kind of think backwards and think uh, another way when it comes to thinking about the way the world was before Europeans arrived. Interestingly, uh, you know, Native American culture is extremely diverse, but interestingly, many of the Native cultures that we think about as kind of the cliche Native cultures were actually products of European um, involvement. The so-called the, the, the Sioux people of the Dakotas, which we all associate with nomadic buffalo hunting, those people, that lifestyle that you saw them living out there was not how they always lived. Those people adapted a new way of existing as a result of the pressure caused by Europeans establishing a foothold on the continent and pushing west. So many of the ways that, Euro that Native Americans lived was a product of European 
interaction and, 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 and decimation in some cases. Uh, disease decimated native tribes, particularly diseases like smallpox, um, a, a European disease. And many tribes on the East Coast ceased to exist from these plagues. And in some cases, the, the remnants of tribes that had effectively died off, the surviving members often formed with other tribes. And they got together and they created whole new tribes. The Seminole tribe in Florida is an example of this, of a, of this kind of a, a conglomerate of different aspects. And in fact, the Seminole native tribe in Florida, there were even cases of what we call the so-called Black Seminole. And the Black Seminole was, were basically members who were either African uh, slave or they were African and indigenous. And they escaped slavery and bondage and they went to Florida and they joined the Seminole tribe and became effectively part of a Native American, a different way of being. So Europeans have a, a, a huge effect on Native American culture. And we often, if we look at the European interpretation, you have to use your imagination to reverse the story, to think about it differently from the perspective of, of the way Native Americans might have seen it. Some Native cultures before European contact also um, lived in permanent dwelling. Of course, the famous Anasazi cliff dwellers, and of course, the Pueblo Indians of the Southwest. Um, these were these cultures had declined from their height at the time of contact with Spanish Americans, but the Spanish, of course, will um, will try to exert their control of the Native Americans in New Mexico, and they try to forcibly convert Native Americans, and the Native Americans in places like like Pueblo will revolt against this in one of the most impressive anti-colonial revolts in early America. There were also mound builders like the Adena who built these large mounds in the Mississippi River Valley. They're also in the Ohio River Valley. Um, such uh, burial mounds, archaeologists suggest, um, display the development of organized society. That Because in the burial mound, there's all kinds of artifacts, traded goods, things that would have been placed in the burial mound as um, burial rituals, effectively. And so these found throughout the Midwest. You can you find them. There's one located on the Ohio, one very close to West Virginia on the Ohio River between Cincinnati and Huntington, West Virginia is one of the first, but they stretch throughout the Mississippi and Ohio River areas. And the largest site at Cahokia, um, Cahokia is huge and believe the site would have been populated by upwards of 25,000 uh, Native Americans at one time. 30. <laughs> Woodland Indian cultures, including the mound builders, were generally village dwellers. They um, lived on hunter-gatherer techniques, basic subsistence agriculture, and hunting animals like, like deer. Um, many, many, many uh, eastern tribes during the 16th century when you're going to see the arrival of Spanish Americans and then later at the beginning of, at the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the, of the, of the 17th century, you'll see the arrival of the English and the French. Uh, many of these tribes were depleted. And this is largely because of the movement of diseases like smallpox from areas of Spanish contact. Uh, smallpox was part of what we call the Columbian Exchange. It was a disease that had been in the old world for a long time in which and which people in the old world still succumb to, but they had developed natural resistances, which allowed them to, um, it prevented the disease from having the kind of fatality rate that um, Native Americans would experience. Uh, smallpox decimated Native Americans. And in fact, uh, even, even near Massachusetts Bay, where Massachusetts Bay Colony will be, when the Plymouth landing story happens, um, when the Pilgrims meet Samoset and Squanto. Um, that area was lightly populated with native tribes, and uh, initially, and that had a lot to do, we believe, with the long-term destruction of European diseases like smallpox, which in certain places um, absolutely decimated the native people. Um, the arrival of Europeans is very, very bad for native cultures, as I'm sure you, you're not surprised to hear, but I think sometimes we uh, discount the sheer scale 
of the absolute transformation of, 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 of life in the Americas, the destruction of life in the Americas. The collision of worlds um, was not just different peoples. It was also people with very different ways of understanding the world, different ways of being, different ways of understanding religion, different ways of understanding um, the environment and the reality and the, the, the manner in which the animals in the environment should be used. Um, for Native Americans, uh, women played a different role in society. Oftentimes, the selection of leaders passed through a matrilineal line, the mother's line. Um, men were the hunters and the fishers, whereas women maintained the community. And so when Europeans come there and they see men who are not in the fields working, but women are in the fields working, they ascribe some kind of, of demeaning perspective on it. European culture was patriarchal. It was male-dominated. Um, and men felt that they had a God-given responsibility to control the, quote, weaker or lesser woman. Um, and that included controlling their sexuality. Um, and so Native Americans were oftentimes um, more scantily clad. Women worked in the fields. Men hunted. And Europeans had the sense that women weren't supposed to do work, that women were supposed to be cared for and that they were supposed to be controlled and well clothed. And so when they come to the Americas and they see Native people, Native women scantily clad working in the fields, they don't understand Native culture and it causes them to um, pass dispersing judgments on Native peoples as though they're barbaric. And this justifies the idea that they're uncivilized and therefore didn't truly have the right to the land that they possessed effectively. Um, Native American religion is animistic, and that means that the spiritual realm is determined and believed to be all around you all the time. And so Native Americans have a great sacred connection with the animals that they hunt and the land that they live on. Europeans have a hierarchical perspective in which they believe in a supreme anthropomorphic creator, a, a human-like creator, and where they believe that basically there is a hierarchical lineage from the creator to the angels to the humans to the animals. And so Europeans tended to believe that they were a creation above animals. And so because of this, they believe that God had effectively given them the right and responsibility to control and develop nature as they saw fit to serve their interests. And so Europeans believe in sort of, quote unquote, pr improving the land, whereas Native Americans believe in living with the land. And that is, very, again, very huge significance for the interaction of peoples. Europeans look at Native Americans and how they live in kind of a symbiotic relationship with the land, and they say, well, they don't control the land. They haven't improved it, so it's not really theirs. And so Europeans consider the land vacant and up for the taking, effectively. According, for, for Native Americans, you know, the land was not something you could own. Um, they did fight over hunting grounds, but generally the land was theoretically open and could not be owned. Europeans have an idea that land can and should be owned and improved. Um, uh, Europeans, you know, uh, bring domesticated livestock and animals uh, and, and, and the ability of an individual to control the land and the beast and to improve it, so to speak, was the sign in their perspective of civilization. And if there was an absence of that, it was a sign of uncivilization. And so Europeans look at the Native Americans as uncivilized and therefore not the rightful, not the rightful controller of land, and they thereby, thereby, thereby justify taking their land and behaving in very inhumane ways towards Native Americans. Consequences of these different ways of being. Um, Europeans tend to view North America and its people as though there are no people there. And that's crazy to think about for us today because we know that the Americas, North, South, Central America, were populated with tremendous civilizations. Some of the most impressive empires of people were in the Americas. The Inca Empire in South America controlled more land mass than all than the Roman Empire did at its height. 
and it was in the Andes Mountains. They built incredible structures. I've been there. Um, I've been to Machu Picchu and Cusco. Um, there are incredible civilizations in the Americas, but the way that Europeans tended to view um, the people in the Americas, and in this case North America, suggested that the land was somehow open and vacant. And they used this to justify the conquest of the native peoples. They deemed native peoples as uncivilized, as practicing witchcraft or devil worship. They deemed the native men were lazy and did not care for their women who were, in their perspective, oversexed. All of these were used from the European perspective as ways to effectively demean the humanity of native peoples and to justify practices that ultimately amount to nothing short of cultural genocide. I want to just show you uh, a few maps of the general areas of, of Native American woodland tribes at the time of the arrival of Columbus. Um, there's three major woodland tribes, or eastern tribes. Uh, one is the Algonquin, pictured here, which were dominant in areas of Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, New York, so forth. There was the Iroquois, who was particularly dominant in the Great Lakes region, but again, you can see the Iroquois were... Um, were also pretty um, far distributed in the eastern area. Um, the Iroquois were famous for the League of Five Nations of, of Iroquois tribes, which Ben Franklin will um, negotiate with dipl diplomatically during the Seven Years' War um, in New York uh, State, or New York, the colony of New York, the area where New York State is today. Uh, the Iroquois were also interesting because of the fundamental role played by women. Women... Uh, selected chiefs, controlled inheritances, inheritances, land, and also the children in that society. And the last of note is the Muskegon, which was in the, the deep south, the Gulf Coast area. Um, and the Muskegon were also uh, mound builders like many of their ancestors in the Mississippi region. Um, and these, these are the tribes that are here, fully flourishing tribes, um, that are here in 1492 um, and will ultimately be fundamentally depopulated over a course of, of several centuries amid European conquest, um, amid European diseases, amid um, um, environmental changes that force Native Americans to change their way of life as well. Okay, guys, I hope this is helpful. Um, let me know if you have any questions.